So our next speaker is Dr. Raj Raj Kumar from CMU. And uh, he's a professor in the Department of Electrical Computer Engineering and Computer Science at CMU. His research interest includes all aspects of embedded real-time system, as well as QS support in operating systems and networking. He was, all, was, he was also the primary founder of TimeSys Corporation, a vendor of embedded Linux and Java products. So let's welcome Dr. Raj Kumar. Give talk. Hello. Uh, uh, good afternoon, folks. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, thanks for being here. I know it's mid afternoon, uh, uh, late week, right? So uh, first of all, let me uh, thank the organizers who I thought uh, did a really good job. Uh, I guess hosting the. Uh, uh, visitors and then putting together a nice schedule and then having you all here. Okay, so it's a good job for the organizers. Uh, so I'm actually particularly gratified to be here on uh, three fronts of you. Okay, so one is that uh, I guess uh, it's good to meet uh, Dr. Helen Gill again from NSF. She is, she was, she is, and she will be the heart and soul of this uh, CPS initiative, which is basically gaining uh, a global and growing presence and momentum. Okay, so I would like to give her a round of applause for that. Okay. And secondly, I guess uh, uh, Dr. Fan Bai, am I following him, all right? So I guess uh, I'll try to uh, uh, emulate as, uh, him as much as I can because you already talked about uh, this challenging domain of our very exciting domain of uh, V2X, uh, vehicle-to-vehicle and vehicle and vehicle infrastructure. I'll give you a, a small sense for uh, how we are doing that. I guess the, the reason I mentioned him is that uh, uh, we have worked with uh, Fan for a long time, for several years now. So I guess uh, as, as a sponsor and as a, as a colleague, it's, it's very gratifying to uh, uh, speak after him. And lastly, I guess uh, we just had uh, Professor uh, Baru speak, right? He's, his research work uh, basically is a classical example of cyber physical systems. Up and down. Uh, right, to building energy, trying to make the earth greener, right? He was trying to minimize energy. At the same time, I saw energy being generated in the audience, right? Lots and lots of interactions. So it's very, very pleased to actually see that uh, people are very interested in the domain. Right? So it's actually good, good to see that. Okay. So I guess uh, going, so jumping back to the uh, topic here, uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, smart transportation. In specific, I'll basically I'll make a quote unquote an intellectual leap and talk about vehicles that drive themselves. Okay. So we are actually, so this effort to basically make vehicles autonomous where they completely drive themselves without humans in the loop. It's a big effort, right? I've listed the only a small, small number of names at Carnegie Mellon, Professor Kumar, Professor Clark, uh, Dr. John Dolan, Professor Platzer, uh, Ripsky, and Watergain, and a whole bunch of staff and students uh, who do the real work, right? Walk around, uh, go around giving talks, okay? And I guess I have to acknowledge in this context, I guess uh, two big sponsors without whom none of this would be happening. Of course, National Science Foundation, the CPS program, uh, this is a big support of this program. We are uh, very grateful for that. And then uh, with General Motors, uh, where uh, Fawn, of course, plays a big role. Uh, actually, so it has been a long-term, very reliable and robust sponsor to basically make this uh, vision happen, if you will. So without uh, their vision and support, uh, autonomous vehicles, uh, the research at CME would not be happening. Okay. So I guess, uh, let me, I guess, lay out the motivation, which I think uh, Fawn already said, just to reinforce the points that you already made. Right? So I guess I talk about society and the automobiles, right? I guess uh, we live in the U.S., uh, happening in the U.S., uh, Americans love affair with the car, right? Pretty, pretty much the 20th century was like that. Okay. Uh, but it turns out that uh, more than a million people die every year, globally speaking, okay? And as more Chinese and more Indians buy more cars as they become more uh, prosperous, the number of deaths will only go up, right? And it turns out that in the age group of 10 to 24, accidents uh, represent the biggest killer of those, of those kids, okay? They have uh, survived uh, uh, childbirth, infancy, and so on, Right, and then childhood diseases, and they basically die in a car accident. Okay? And then literally, globally speaking, tens of millions of injuries, and if you add them up, I, mean, I would think that's actually an estimate, half a trillion dollars worth of productivity, if you will, is basically being wasted because of uh, deaths and injuries of, all of that kind. Okay? We, are not, we are not quantifying the sorrow and the grief that uh, the uh, individual families go through, right? ignoring all of that. Okay? And then I guess uh, if you think, in terms of, I guess, uh, are people getting older and so on, uh, I guess you're all young. You can't even imagine getting old, right? 
but at least for the women in the audience, I guess uh, if you fast forward 70 years from now, right? So typically it's the case that uh, men die off soon, right? The women basically are uh, living by themselves, right? At some point in time, they cannot drive anymore, they lose their driving license. You don't have a license, you're living by yourself, you cannot go anywhere, right? So you basically lose your uh, uh, mobility, your independence and your self-esteem, and the quality of life can go down dramatically. Right? And then I guess uh, in terms of uh, traffic delays, I guess uh, you're, uh, I guess you're uh, blessed to be living in Urbana-Champagne where there's this great university, right? I don't think traffic jam is that big a problem, right? <laughs> let's, let's be frank, right? I know that you hate the traffic light which takes a long time to basically change, Okay, but you can live with it, right? But people actually, actually that's only about a couple of weeks back, there was a new statistic that got released. Essentially, what it says is that uh, on the average, a US commuter spends about a week of your, of your, of your year, every year, or one week every year is wasted being stuck in traffic jams, okay? Don't compare the campaign that's averaged against all the traffic jams that are happening in Manhattan, Los Angeles, and uh, of course, uh, downtown Chicago, okay? A week of your time goes away in stuck in traffic jams, okay? So you can think of your productivity basically being lost, but two percent gone right there, okay? But meanwhile, the average person commutes for how long? About roughly between 30 and 45 minutes each way every day of the, of the, of the work day, right? Every work week, right? Add all those hours up, we are literally talking about humongous amounts of time, right? If, if only cars can drive themselves, you get in and say, take me to work, sit back, right? Send that email to the advisor, right? As if you're doing some work, <laughs> right? He is happy or she is happy, and meanwhile, then you can take a nap. That takes you to work, <laughs> right? And then so you, it's productive, right? Well, I'm sure you could use some more sleep, right? If you say no, your advisor is listening. <laughs> right? So basically, enormous productivity gains will result. Okay? So that's keep that in mind, traffic delays as well. Okay? So I guess there are some pictures of basically of things that uh, do happen and uh, where things go wrong plentifully. Okay? So I guess the goal that I guess we have at Cedrox is basically twofold. From a cyber physical systems long term vision point of view, we want to make automobiles be autonomous, drive themselves and therefore basically give us all these benefits where less, fewer people die, uh, right? uh, basically older uh, women, for example, uh, can move around still because they don't need to drive, and then meanwhile traffic congestion hopefully can be managed and so on. So that's basically, we want to basically have a long-standing impact on society, number one, right? The secondary goal from a research perspective is that, hey, can we actually build a scientific and technological foundations to basically make transportation safer and more autonomous? So basically that's the bigger vision of having a societal impact, the secondary goal of basically having the resource happen, right? So the common person cares about the first one, we as researchers care about the second one, we have both, everybody ought to be happy. So the moment you talk about vehicles that drive themselves, you obviously have a whole bunch of reactions, right? So let me basically play this video and uh, here, wizards at Carnegie Mellon University. They call this car with the brain, Boss. I just don't like it. I'd rather drive myself, I think. That's scary. Why? You'd want to be in control. But the Boss is probably a better driver than you or I. Students built it for a Pentagon competition called the DARPA Urban Challenge. And it plied its way through a simulated urban environment without so much as a ding fender. It was the undisputed champion in 2007. But the team didn't stop there. Their leader, electrical and computer engineer Raj Rajkumar, has led them down the road to a more precise, refined navigation system. They are supported by corporate sponsors and the National Science Foundation. It's constantly using its uh, lasers, radars, and cameras to see what is going on. It's my turn to go, but I see somebody else uh, uh, coming in. It says, I'm stopping. The latest challenge is programming Boss to valet park. Raj Kumar predicts that in as little as 10 years, this automotive marvel could replace human drivers on the road. 
The truth is, more and more Americans are paying less and less attention to the task at hand when they're driving. They're texting, they're talking, they're putting on makeup, they're shaving, they're reading a newspaper, <laughs> or they're talking to a camera. But it can be a real killer. In 2008, 6,000 people died on U.S. highways because of distracted driving accidents. Another half million were injured. But will human drivers be ready to take a back seat? For some, not so much. Oh, no. <laughs> That's a little dangerous. <laughs> Others say, bring it on. Oh, that'd be wonderful. Sound like a good idea to me. To cut down on D-Rock, um, Detroit driving. You just sit back and relax in the car, catch up on news, read email, or even take a nap, and leave the driving to boss. For Science Nation, I'm Miles O'Brien. So I guess, so there are two sides to the coin, right? So I guess, does anybody not fly here in a plane as a passenger? So you don't have to fly in a plane, okay. Okay, so also he's local, so he doesn't fly, right? But like pretty much when you actually fly on a long distance flight, okay, who's flying the plane most of the time? Autopilot. An autopilot, okay? So it's basically, you, whenever you fly, your life depends on computers and software sensors and actuators, meaning on cyber physical systems. You have already putting your been life all along on cyber, basically we want to basically bring it from the sky, to, from the blue sky down to earth, literally. Like, that's, all, that's all that we are trying to do, right? The challenges of course are a lot better. There's no air traffic control, there's no radars happening and so on. Everything has to be making local decisions. So the problem is a lot more complex, but that's what we are, right? So then basically, so for example, clip, I'd said, uh, I predicted in 10 years that this will be in place. I said that last year this clip is about a year old. Right? So I have nine years left, right? And the question is, uh, hey, uh, so, and uh, lots of people say, Raj is crazy, right? So why would anything happen in nine years? This, uh, this seems like a humongous leap, uh, conceptually, technologically, uh, practically speaking, and so on. Okay? So the technology, I believe, actually will be there nine years from now, okay? The question is, uh, hey, uh, why do I think it's rational? Am I really crazy? I don't think so, okay? So I'll take it talking about, so I guess uh, in very, on a very real sense of the word, I'm talking about a revolution in transportation, right? Where you don't need a chauffeur, right? The vehicle is just driving, taking you wherever you want to go, right? In the very real sense is the revolution, okay? But practically speaking, I actually contain the change will end up being very incremental. Why is that, right? So basically, so things need to change fundamentally, but in a very practical sense, right? So for example, uh, right, pretty much every car that you buy today does have cruise control. What does it mean? If you engage cruise control, you take your foot off of the gas pedal, right, and it's driving itself. The gas pedal is not under your control, right? The high-end cars, if you're rich enough, the high-end cars basically have something called adaptive cruise control, where they use radar sensors to basically detect that there's a car in front. If you have normal cruise control, if you actually are at a higher speed than the car in front of you, you have to cancel uh, cruise control and then slow down. You have to do that. With adaptive cruise control, it knows that there's a, a car in front of it and actually it actually automatically slow itself. And taken to the extreme, actually you can buy the cars with that feature, but actually going towards the intersection, if there's a car stop there, the car will actually stop itself completely, right? So what this means is that at that point in time, computers are actually controlling both the gas pedal and the brake pedal. Today, in the market, you can buy that, okay? You can actually buy actually the high-end, I think the uh, model is coming out this year, last year, and so on. Also have a feature called lane departure warning. We are basically drifting off of the lane because you're on the cell phone, right? It can actually uh, warn you and then actually nudge you back onto the right lane, okay? What does it mean? It's actually taking control of the steering wheel. So steer, right? And then if you actually look at, take a look at basically autonomous parallel parking, which you can buy as well, right? not in all models, very high in some a couple of vendors, okay? It's basically taking control of your steering, your braking and your gas pedal, basically if I do parallel parking, which I still cannot do really well. Okay, it can do it. Okay, it's happening today. So as more and more of these features actually come in, we are already used to basically giving up uh, control of the gas pedal, brake pedal, I guess with adaptive cruise control that's happening, and then with parallel parking, all of that, you, we are used to it. So nine years down the road, 10 years down the road, or basically or 15 years down the road, it's actually available as a productizable uh, car that you can buy, to you, it's very natural. You've been doing this all along. More and more features, more and more features, you're giving up more and more and more control. Eventually, you just move from the driver's seat to the back seat, which will become a lot more spacious. You can lie back and sleep. 
Okay? So the guy actually, so the change eventually will actually end up not being revolutionary, but being very natural and, uh, and very organic. Okay? You can look back historically and say, wow, what a big leap from the 20th century to 21st century, but as it happens, unwinds in practice, it will be incremental. Okay? So revolution in this case is happening in increments. Okay? So autonomy when that is in place, lives will be saved, accidents will be minimized, and the changes would have been revolutionary. So I guess not to basically make that uh, feasible in practice from a technological perspective, we clearly need to have the autonomous vehicle do the right thing, right? So basically it needs to be able to sense the environment, be situation aware, what's happening around it, right? Being able to process all this data coming in, communicate both internally and externally, and then actuate, right, all your uh, actuators in the car for correct operations, okay? And then uh, basically, I guess I classify these challenges exogenous challenges, meaning external challenges. The real world is nasty. It was raining all day yesterday, for example. Right? Uh, so you basically have bad weather conditions, bad lighting conditions, horrendous road conditions at times, construction, accidents, right? And information in your map, for example, could be outdated, and then you can actually lose GPS because uh, of buildings on your side or in a little canyon and so on. So basically, so the, the world that you have to drive in can throw hard balls, curve balls at you. You're going to deal with that. Okay? It's not within your control. Okay? The other set of challenges would be what I call endogenous challenges, meaning coming from the inside, where we can basically have sensors fail, actuators fail, processors fail, communications fail, and so on. Right? And meanwhile, your sensors that used to work yesterday may not work quite well today because there's a calibration problem now, there's some physical wear and tear that happened, and things are slowly going bad as opposed to completely fail. Right? So these are things within our control in a sense because we can design things appropriately to you. Right? The world throws challenges at you, but there are things that happen within your, your control as well. And then I guess uh, there's the interaction phenomenon which uh, uh, Dr. Bai actually talked about very eloquently. The vehicles, if uh, we can use laptops with Wi-Fi, our, our cars should basically have uh, Wi-Fi, our smartphones have Wi-Fi, they should be talking to each other. So it's basically the vehicle network, basically where they can communicate in a secure fashion and then coordinate uh, each other's behavior. Of course, lastly, for basically consumers to say, hey, I'm basically willing to actually buy this. I fly, but the pilot's door is closed, but it's the computer actually flying it, we don't know it. Right? Most people don't know. But basically, for, for you to be in that, you literally have to accept that. Uh, you have, for that, uh, it has to be reliable, uh, affordable, and maintainable. And then eventually, of course, we cannot uh, mandate that uh, until uh, uh, starting tomorrow, all cars on the road will be autonomous. That is never, ever going to happen. Right? So in which case, we have to have a mix of uh, human-driven vehicles and autonomous vehicles. Okay? So those are challenges from a very high level of view. So technically speaking, you can actually uh, say this, that uh, uh, applies across multiple CPS domains, cyber physical system domains. We need to have a science, if you will. A theory of uncertainty comes into play, for example, uh, both the exogenous challenges and the endogenous challenges, we need a theory of uncertainty. We need to be able to compose how the physical components behave, how the cyber subsystems behave, and how they actually integrate together. Right? And how do we make the system be dependable, safe, secure, and maintain privacy constraints, as, uh, satisfy privacy requirements, and all of this has to be happening in real time. And then, of course, we have to capture somehow the physics of wear and tear. Right? And then how do we optimize so that we can actually reduce the cost of the components, uh, both sensors, actuators, and processors, and communications? And then can we do model-based design? What does even a model mean? Because there's uh, cyber sub uh, subsystems, there are uh, physical subsystems. You really have to have an integrated model, if you will, that spans uh, multiple domains and multiple layers. Okay. And then, of course, how do you verify and validate this? Right? We can uh, test all day long. Is it good enough? Right? Never good enough, it turns out. Okay. And then that's, so then that's the engineering aspect of this, where we need basically to pick components that you can buy off the shelf and build the systems. And then what you're really operating is basically a network of autonomous vehicles. It's a system of system of systems of systems. If you okay. And we need to be able to specialize for domains like autonomous vehicles. We need to have test beds, uh, right? So where basically uh, a GM or vendors or uh, researchers like us can basically demonstrate that these things work. And of course, we need to be able to make it economically affordable. And then lastly, for example, if something does go wrong, we need to have this critical capability where we say, hey, I know that something is not functioning as it should, and then actually take the system to a safe shutdown state. Right? What does that mean? It doesn't mean that, for example, if I'm on the highway driving autonomously, something goes wrong, I cannot basically say, I'll turn off all actuators, all processors, I'm done. Right? Loss of physics still apply, the vehicle is still moving, it has momentum inertia. Right? You need to be able to understand 
still the context of where you are try to basically move on to the shoulder and come to a safe uh, steady stop right or worse come to worse basically at least you uh, put on your ha hazard lights and so on and come to a decent stop so the person behind you does not ram into you right so it's, there's lots and lots of different things that need to be taken so there has to be robust uh, shutdown mechanisms and policies so let me so break down uh, the uh, remain remainder of the talk in about uh, roughly three segments okay Segment one, I guess I'll give uh, some sense for, I guess, vehicle connectivity, which uh, Dr. Fon Bai uh, is, is the one of the prominent uh, world, world experts on the topic. Right? I'll basically, I guess, uh, give you a sense for a little bit of work that we have done at CMU. And then I'll basically talk about uh, the autonomous vehicle competition that CMU was involved in to give you a sense for what's happening. Then lastly, I'll talk about, hey, uh, what is happening in recent years. Let's give you a sense. As uh, uh, Dr. Bais talked about, there are safety applications, there are uh, traffic management applications, there are even data sharing applications and so on. Okay? And then so basically what we built was basically if you do multi-hop networking between cars on the roads, we can actually have uh, some cars, for example, have uh, smartphones with uh, 3G connectivity, for example. They in turn can actually propagate information from this vehicular network uh, uh, right, to the network, to the internet. And then basically you can also actually send that information to actually any remote center. In this case, our colleagues, our GM colleagues in Detroit, Michigan, while our network of vehicles running in Pittsburgh, our colleagues, our GM colleagues in Michigan actually can watch it remotely. Okay? And they can actually even try to influence what is happening in Pittsburgh remotely. Okay? By saying that, hey, they can actually, for example, fake a message that is coming from this vehicle. Sitting in Detroit, they send a message to this car and say, hey, propagate a message and then it's supposed to show up here, they can call somebody in this car and say, hey, did you get a message? And if so, what message did you get? Right? And if you say the right message, they trust us and say, okay, you got it. Okay? So we can do the things like that. Okay? So basically, there are more vehicle to vehicle and vehicle infrastructure applications, which is called as V2X, that's basically just a setup inside the car. Um, so, let, you know, so I guess so we built this tool called GrooveNet, which stands for Geographical Routing of Vehicular Networks. Okay? And then what you see here basically is uh, a map of the area around Carnegie Mellon. For those of you who've been to campus, uh, Forbes Avenue is the arterial road right in front of uh, Carnegie Mellon. And we basically we have uh, cars that can be running around real roads, if you will. Right? We have a bunch of simulated cars on the left, but we also have a bunch of real cars. So these cars are five of the cars that uh, GM had donated to us, and then a bunch of simulated cars. So the real cars are actually interacting with the simulated cars. The simulated cars are sending back information to the real cars. So everybody thinks, every car in here thinks that it's real and we are actually simulating a very large scale network. Right? So even with GM's resources or with our, uh, our uh, uh, resources, we really cannot be running experiments with thousands and thousands of cars. This is what a real time town will have. We are able to basically mimic that setting, basically having a mixture of real and simulated vehicles. Okay? So we have simulated vehicles and real vehicles and then we can actually have real network connectivity, both uh, DSRC that he talked about as well as uh, 3G connectivity. Okay? So let me just uh, play this. This is a simulation only. Uh, basically, a network of uh, vehicles actually running in uh, uh, Manhattan, downtown Manhattan. Okay. So you see that there are only basically a small number of vehicles. Okay. So clearly, Manhattan on a, on a bad time of the day, you will have literally thousands and thousands of vehicles. Right. We are saying that only a fraction of those vehicles basically have DSRC capability, and they are kind of roughly uniformly spread out uh, through Manhattan. Okay. And what we'll do is the, is the following. I guess I need to play the video. What we'll do is uh, at the southern tip of uh, downtown Manhattan, we'll basically generate a message saying that there has been a problem here, a crash or an accident. Okay? And then as the other cars, the ho hollow triangles will become uh, solid triangles when they get information. Okay? So actually, the so message got, uh, starts getting propagated, gets start getting propagated. And actually, it turns out that the message actually goes from southern tip of uh, Man Manhattan to uptown Manhattan in about 70 seconds. Okay? With about roughly 7-8% of penetration, market penetration, information processing is very quickly. Right? So getting to 0 to 7-8% is still a ma major uh, uh, challenge. But if we can get there, we don't have to get 100%, information can become very useful very quickly. Okay? And I guess uh, let me uh, skip this uh, video here. We have done the same simulation in Boston. I guess those of you from Boston know that there are a couple of uh, very key bridges. So there's basically a cluster of activity here, a cluster of activity there. So something happens out here. This information really does not get across. It's really a disconnected graph until a, a vehicle or two with the DSRC radios crosses this bridge, at which point in time, information will propagate to the other side very quickly as well. Okay? So it's actually, you can basically have mobility helps you quite a bit in reestablishing graph connectivity. Okay? 
So then we said, so what about uh, B2V? How can we apply it to, I guess, to a local context, right? So pretty much all of us know, I guess, there are uh, lots of traffic lights in uh, Champaign, Urbana as well, right? So all of us uh, know uh, how traffic lights work. So I'll, I'll just play that. So I guess this is a normal traffic light, except that uh, uh, when, I, when the traffic light turns green, uh, you can either go straight or make a right or make a left. That's the uh, mode that's being simulated on the video there. Okay. Uh, so we, so we have the idea is that we measure what the delays, the throughput through the intersection are using a traffic light. No big deal, right? So this has been happening for uh, literally many, many decades now. Okay. So then we said the following. So it turns out that uh, more than 90% of intersections in the US, US is a very big country, it turns out, right? More than 90% of intersections do not have traffic lights. Okay, and what happens? Lots and lots of accidents do happen at, uh, at intersections, it turns out, right? So, so that's one. So with traffic lights, there is a centralized entity which controls when you can go, based on, I guess, these guys in this case had, uh, so those guys, we don't see the green light on the side, they get to go, right? So centralized entity tells cars when you can go, when you cannot go. Right? That's one. And then, so we said, so then you better let's look at the completely the other extreme end of the spectrum. So when, for example, when you all leave this room and the stock is done, right? You're, you're waiting for that, right? When it, when it is done, we all go. There's no central entity which tells basically, hey, you need to go to this point, that need to go to this point, don't run into the person and so on. We all of us, we basically walk, make sure that the other person is ahead of you, we give them precedence and they keep going, and all of us go out, right? Alive. So you can think of now, basically, I'll take it to, for example, I guess the right model, is some of you are from Europe, I'm sure. I see Marco in there, right? Think of the big open uh, plazas in uh, European uh, downtowns and so on. Or center of town, it's not a downtown, right? So it's a town center, right? Big plazas, big open spaces. Tons and tons of people moving around. They're not bumping to each other. There's no central entity which tells basically when you should go, when you should not go. They're still able to make progress without bumping into each other. What the heck is going on? The reasoning is very simple. It's all distributed decision making. Everybody makes a local decision of what to do next, right? And everybody has a brain, mostly, <laughs> right? We have sensors, eyes and ears and so on, and we process that information, and then we actually actuate, and we keep moving, and we are all of us are making progress, right? That's the other extreme, no traffic light. So then the question is, why the heck do I need a traffic light? If people can do it, right, with, uh, I guess, distractions and so on. So we basically, so for example, let's, let's look at that paradigm. Let me play this video. I believe it's an Asian city, Asian city, which shall remain unnamed. No traffic light. It happens on a day-to-day -day basis. I can show you, I guess, videos from uh, other, other places as well, okay? Equally bad or even worse, okay? So, we, it is, there exists a paradigm that we do not need a centralized entity, you make progress, right? Honking goes a long way, right? So, then we said, okay, let's basically build an intersection where there is no traffic light control. There is no traffic light. We still want to basically make progress, so we'll basically mimic what we just saw in the Asian city, we basically make uh, local decisions. We basically have a distributed protocol where each entity is an agent. They make uh, distributed decisions. As long as they are following uh, similar rules, they should be making progress. Okay? So that's basically what we built. So let me play this. So this is using V2V. No traffic light. They're just basically broadcasting messages as they get to an intersection. They're saying that, hey, I'm coming to the intersection in this direction. I'm going straight, uh, right, or making a left. Right? And others do the same thing. So you hear others' messages. Hopefully, they hear your messages and so on. And they basically decide, hey, it's my turn to go or it's not my turn to go. I wait. Okay? And it turns out that actually you can uh, build this. Okay? So we have multiple versions of this uh, protocol and so on. So you do not need a traffic light. All you need is a DSRC radio and smart speed. Yeah. Okay? So it turns out that if you actually measure this, so you can do the same measurements that we did on the, with the traffic lights. So the graph looks like that. But let me skip the uh, graph. So just jumping to the punch line. With uh, V2V, the delay through that uh, video that you saw for on the average for a car was about 13 seconds. And it turns out that with traffic lights, depending upon how you uh, uh, turn uh, the, the lights, how often you turn the lights on, the delays are about an order of magnitude higher. Okay? I can make these numbers be uh, much more biased one way or the other, depending upon how you pick the arrival rates and so on. But it just gives you a sense for you can actually get tremendous gains in throughput. Okay? 
without investing more into the infrastructure, 90 percent of the second don't have uh, uh, traffic lights anyway. Right? Putting only this uh, 50 to 70 dollar radio in there, we can uh, accomplish big things. Right? While throughput has gone up significantly, safety was never compromised. Okay? Doing one of the simulations, actually we did see a simulator crash, but there was a bug in the program, you fixed the first bug. Okay? <laughs> so it really, okay, so we can keep doing that. And then the question is, hey Raj, okay, simulations, I can write my simulations, so, you know. I never trust simulations myself, right? How do you know that there's no bug in the simulator, right? So let's do it for real. So basically, I'll go to uh, just play one video from the screen. So we, we basically, uh, we have a segue, it's kind of a, it's not the commercial version. Uh, these things, I guess, there'll be two segways, one going that way, one going the opposite direction, the perpendicular direction, that is. So that's uh, what's called a robotic mobile platform. It's a uh, segue, except that it's, there's no place for a human to stand. You can put, uh, that's a circular tray on top where you can put stuff, okay? So there's one basically goes this way. In this direction, the other basically goes the other way, okay? So if that is, uh, they're not coming to the intersection at the same time, they keep moving, okay? So now we're basically going to run this intersection protocol where they are coming to the intersection at the same time from two different angles you see, okay? If they actually, so uh, they do not slow down, they will run into each other. This guy basically lost the battle if you early, he had to slow down, and then he speeds up, and a collision is avoided. Okay. So actually, we actually did show that actually this, this works in practice as well, okay? Of course, we cannot have uh, 2,000 uh, segues and so on, but uh, so in conceptually speaking, this is true, okay? But let me add the caveat, right? For this protocol to work, you need 100% market penetration, everybody coming in, should basically have that uh, radio, should be able to process the messages, right? So practically speaking, that's not going to happen anytime soon, okay, for a large number of reasons, right? What you can have indeed is, we basically have sensors in the cars, even if you do not tell me that you're actually coming because you do not have a radio, my sensors will tell me there's somebody out there, so maybe we can come up with enhanced protocols, right? So that will probably be the, the transition mechanism to actually go across the leap, okay? And I guess uh, this is, uh, uh, cheesy video, if the others were not cheesy enough for you. So going to, I guess, endogenous challenge when things can fail, actually we built a bunch of different uh, scale model cars. So this is a, a scale model car, 116 the size. We actually put in a bunch of uh, ECUs, which we actually uh, uh, communicating wirelessly. Uh, this is not a Toys R Us car. It's really uh, honest to God, uh, things that uh, with our ECUs, with uh, uh, controllers, 16-bit microcontrollers and so on, okay? So we're able to basically control that. So if you look at the, the wiring in here, basically we have, uh, for each function for uh, uh, driving, for braking and so on, we actually have replicated controllers and buses as well. So what we can do, for example, is uh, pick up the car and turn off the power of one of these modules, right? Mimicking a failure, it will still run. Because the other replicated car, uh, ECU, the electronic control unit, will basically know that the other guy has failed, will take over the functionality. If we had uh, turned the other guy off first, this guy would pick it up, okay? So we are actually able to show this, because it's much easier to test it in this, this scale uh, as opposed to a real vehicle, okay? So I guess now going back, now putting uh, the bigger and bigger pieces together, right? I talked about uh, in GrooveNet, we were able to actually have real vehicles interact with simulated vehicles, so actually we are able to do it in a bigger platform as well. We automated, uh, you see the car soon, should come up. So we, uh, the power wheels car that actually kids get as present for uh, Christmas and so on, actually uh, kids can sit in there, actually drive the vehicle at very, very low speeds. So we wish, oh my gosh, I really uh, missed it. So if you look at the green car, I can let me play this again. So you'll see a green car coming in. The green car actually represents the, the real car. So whatever the green car should be doing in this simulated world, this guy will be doing it physically. Okay. So that's the point that uh, so this is supposed to make. So let me play that again. So watch for the green car. So it's basically hybrid emulation, simulation and emulation combined, if you will, with a, a real uh, cyber physical object in the picture. So the green car is out there, so this guy is running, right? it's a rear wheel drive. When it turns, you see that this is turning as well. Okay? So it actually is making a turn, and then it's going straight, so actually going. So it's actually weird. Uh, in live, actually, it's a, look, it's a lot more impressive. Okay? So it's basically, I guess, so, so we can basically mimic a large scale setting with bigger and bigger objects, okay? and then it turns out that uh, we have built two scale model vehicles, that's the power wheels thing, and this is the vehicle I'll talk about soon, uh, uh, autonomous vehicle, and that's another autonomous vehicle. Yeah, so getting real, real and real, but the more risky uh, technologies are being prototyped here, so that's a big thing. So now, let's jump to autonomous vehicles. Okay. So 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 I guess, uh, uh, if, uh, you may or may not know, in 2007, 
DARPA held a so-called urban challenge where the idea was that an autonomous vehicle should be able to drive 60 miles in less than six hours with multiple autonomous vehicles uh, competing with each other on a semi-urban uh, course, if you will. Uh, uh, real enough for all practical purposes with a bunch of other vehicles that are driven by humans, bunch of qualifiers and so on. Okay? And then uh, the vehicles were being judged as if they were being drive, driven by a human, so you had to actually satisfy uh, California Department of Motor Vehicle Rules. When you got your driving license, the person sitting next to you, right, literally grading you, the same uh, rules, if you will, were applicable here. Okay? So they had to negotiate uh, stationary obstacles, moving obstacles, uh, roadways could be blocked. Uh, you could have gone through that roadway five minutes earlier, it was clear. Next time you come around, it could be blocked. You've got to figure this actually blocked and basically figure an alternate uh, plan around that. Okay? So all in real time, with no human intervention, humans not in the car. Okay? So it has to be able to uh, turn, stop, pass, merge, follow, and so on. Reason about traffic, overall it has to basically progress safely in the face of adverse conditions. Okay? So that's the uh, vehicle that uh, our team from Mechanical and uh, fielded. Uh, surprise, it is a GM vehicle. Uh, Chevy Tahoe, okay, and with a whole bunch of other, uh, of course, friendly sponsors. So let me, I guess, just give you a quick sense for what happened then for the for the course, for example. So that, that's a documentation camera. So that's a vehicle from Ford. Okay. So this vehicle is actually uh, videotaping. It's uh, what it sees from a visual point of view, and recording it. Okay. We get to see it when the vehicle comes back. More precisely, if the vehicle comes back, there's no guarantee that it comes back, right? So there are lots and lots of intersections like these. So each autonomous car basically had a chase vehicle driven by a human. Okay, so in this case, you see there is a car waiting there, there is a car that is waiting there. We come to an intersection, we let that car pass because it has precedence. Then this car has the next precedence, right, right away. Eventually moves, and even though this car had come towards intersection well before us, it is coming to the intersection at this point. So we have precedence. It knows that it's able to make a turn at that point. Okay. So it understands the rules of the road, if you will, right? make the right decisions. Okay. So it gives you a sense for, uh, for, so you should look at this car. Uh, I guess it's actually a big uh, truck. Uh, it's basically from a military contractor. I should say this, uh, that car was my biggest night. If they run into us, we are done. <laughs> right? Couple of guys, we are done. Okay. Okay. So uh, eventually they actually ran to building and were disqualified. I was very happy. <laughs> <laughs> So let's so now let's basically uh, play this. Okay. So let me say, just set the stage. We are going towards a similar intersection. There are tons of intersections like these. Okay, out there, you see there is something happening out there. Something's happening. That's an autonomous vehicle. That's an autonomous vehicle. One is in the wrong lane, facing the wrong way. Okay. So that's what's happening. So the, some of these autonomous vehicles running. Uh, most of them are running for a, a so test software. Should play. So we're going there. This guy is there, so that has precedence. It's not moving. And we want to go straight, that car is blocking our way. What do you do in real life? First of all, you swear. Right? And then you basically to make an ally plan B. So in this case, basically it takes plan B and makes a left and keeps moving. Right? And here is, I guess, I'll just show this uh, quickly as well to give, give you a sense. So it turns out this is, was the fastest road segment in the course, driving at uh, the 30 miles per hour of the speed limit. There's some human-driven vehicle on the left lane all by itself, we have no idea why. Okay. It actually passes them on the right, which is legal in California, changes lanes with a safe gap with the next car. The reason it changed uh, lanes was that when it uh, gets there, it actually may, it needs to make a left, which is why it changed lanes. Now you see it actually went from uh, the fastest road segment in the course to an unpaved road, and you see the contrast, dark shadows and very bright light, so cameras will have a hard time if you will, right? because the dynamic range is very broad. Okay? So it was able to basically uh, uh, do all this, and then uh, I guess uh, six minutes completed. So basically, I think uh, the key lesson from the DARPA Urban Challenge was that people used to think that autonomous vehicles are science fiction. It belongs in the Jetsons, the 22nd, 23rd century. The DARPA Urban Challenge showed that, no, it is not science fiction. The impossible is actually possible. Six vehicles completed the race, five within the allocated six hours. But six completed, okay? And I guess, uh, so we came in first, uh, right? Actually, uh, I guess we are proud to say that uh, we are ahead of the second team by 20 minutes or so, okay? But, uh, but the, uh, the point is that six vehicles actually completed, autonomous vehicles are well within our reach today, okay? Like I said, in 10 years, I expect to basically be able to do this, okay? 
So basically, I guess just to give you a sense for, we had a whole bunch of sensors uh, for detecting roads, obstacles, we are tracking vehicles, and then we collect a whole bunch of, again, we had about 18 sensors, so, so lasers, radars, and cameras. We get some raw data, we extract some features like uh, lines and right angles, we validate some measurements between them uh, based on uh, calibration, if you will, of uh, different sensors, so we know where, where which are roads or which are obstacles and so on. We are collecting data continuously, so relating two consecutive uh, data points, for example, we can understand, for example, this is what radars do, you can basically say, this object has moved from this, this location to a different location. We internally basically form a bunch of hypotheses uh, and then correlate them with uh, what you're seeing. There's some internal multiple hypotheses basically get uh, compared and we pick a model which makes sense and then uh, statistically speaking and then we end up with basically building what we call is a, is a real world model. Okay. So the vehicle basically is able to fuse information from many sensors, right? understanding what the uh, parameters it expects in the, in the real world, and it's able to build a, a model of the real world in which it is driving, so it kind of knows what is going on. And if you actually look at it uh, closely enough, and when, a ve when a vehicle is moving, actually it's also not just projecting from the past to the present, it's also projecting into the future, it needs to know what it expects other vehicles to be doing. Okay? And as you project more and more into the future, its confidence level actually decreases. Okay? And it's constantly updating as it goes. Okay? So it's all, all of that was done. So I'm going to skip uh, this slide uh, as a video which basically kind of shows uh, that it was not a perfect. Uh, so the, I guess we did, I thought, a really excellent job with respect to uh, the team performance and so on, right? Because we couldn't be uh, a more proud, if you will. But that said, there are lots of imperfections, okay? So this, uh, this video will actually show you that. But I'm going to uh, sk skip that, okay? So let me uh, uh, change tracks for a few minutes and talk about scientific challenges, right? This is not just an engineering challenge, and which it is, okay? but that's basically a bunch of fundamental uh, scientific challenges. Okay. So let me just give you a sense. Okay. We did tons and tons of testing. I think by a huge margin, we should have tested more than any other team out there okay, that participated in this challenge. Okay. So, uh, we actually used to do uh, unit testing on a simulator, then the same code actually could be run on the actual vehicle. We do unit testing, and then functional testing of features. We would do integrated testing with a whole bunch of functions uh, put together. Then we would basically do uh, uh, elaborate stress testing with so many different scenarios being tested every week and so on. As time went on, testing was happening on a daily basis. As we moved closer to the competition, we used to have uh, endurance tests where the vehicle has to run for multiple hours. Okay, under complex situations and see whether we can actually we can drive this for six, seven, eight hours because the race was going to be six hours. And as bugs will show up, we'll fix them. We had safety drivers on the driver's seat and so on to take over something go, go wrong and bugs were fixed and so on. And then uh, the last few endurance tests were really, really good. No bugs were seen. The finally the debates were should we turn on a feature that we had a safety feature or not, right? That was the final, uh, the, the debate in the final days before the competition. The day of the competition, we had at least three bugs show up. At least three bugs. We had done this humongous amount of testing. Everything was kosher. We all said certified, 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 certified. On race day, like three core bugs show up. Okay. And now we can look back and say, yeah, 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 that's that's a bug. Oh, we know, we know. Okay. But it doesn't show up. So you can be testing all day long, forever. You can write like people will say, testing can only show that a bug is present. It cannot prove that a bug is absent. Okay? So you really have to have, have something else to basically verify, validate that actually this is doing the right thing. So for example, we have uh, Professor Andre Platz looking at the verification of hybrid systems. He can basically, for example, hierarchically uh, capture what happened on a single lane with multiple cars, multiple lanes with multiple cars and so on, and basically capture the nonlinear dynamics that happen across these cars, how they communicate with each other and so on. And then by going through a, a, a very sequential incremental process, if you will, local lane control, global lane control, local highway control, global highway control, and so on. I cannot go into the details here. Using something called uh, QDDL, quantified differential dynamic uh, la logic, he was able to basically prove that hey, if you are actually changing lanes with adaptive cruise control and uh, lane control uh, software in there, you can actually formally prove that actually the system will be safe and there will be no collision. Okay? Very early stages of the work, but this is the kind of directions that uh, research that NSF funds can actually show that, hey, scientifically, there are ways to basically demonstrate that something that you built, some protocol that you built actually has the right property. And I'll talk about recently the analysis as well. Okay? So it turns out that, for example, if a vehicle is actually going along, there's an obstacle, you would, I guess, even though that's kind of the opposite lane, you really want to bypass the obstacle and, and merge back. Right? So the question then is, hey, what is the trajectory that I'll be taking? And can I determine that this trajectory is going to be safe, that I will not be hitting this obstacle? Simple question. 
just turns out that this, this being a hybrid system context with continuous variables and discrete variables in software and so on. There's a bunch of modeling uncertainties that are the measurements have still have uh, errors in them as well. And then meanwhile, real life throws uh, disturbances at you that may be potholes in the road and so on. Okay. So I guess, uh, so, uh, so the idea basically is that if you try to do very precise calculations, it will take forever, you will never get it done. The idea is to basically uh, come up with some uh, 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 approximations, if you will, to basically define uh, what is we call a reachable set. And then we'll just basically compute those approximations and make sure that as long as the reachable set does not uh, hit the obstacle, we are okay. So in this case, actually says that uh, the approximate calculations of these uh, squares we, where we could be actually hits the obstacle. So you can make the appropriate refinements if you want. And then, so for example, uh, we start with the initial set. We actually compute approximations of a reachable set, and there are possible trajectories within that uh, reachable set. Uh, with as example trajectories. And we actually applied it to uh, our, our real example and we said, hey, uh, turns out that if that's the path that you want to take, the actual movement of the vehicle would be this darker lens in here. And we were able to actually, I guess Professor Dolan was able to show that uh, in all cases, or at least uh, in the, the runs that were run, you're always within the reachable, safe path across the obstacle. Okay? So these pro properties have to be put formally. If you will. Okay? The uh, engineering challenges, scientific challenges. Okay, so I guess uh, just more of the same. Okay, then it turns out that uh, we can actually do these calculations, quote unquote, two times faster than real time, if that means anything to you. And uh, this was mentioned by uh, uh, Dr. Gale, uh, at least in a conversation. Uh, Ed Clark, uh, who I, I guess is kind of the founding father of uh, model checking, if you will. I guess uh, uh, Dr. Sipak is also a co-inventor, if you will. Uh, has been lately working on something called statistical model checking, is very interested in the domain of cyber physical system, making sure that these things work correctly. Okay? His argument is that, hey, I fly on a plane, if that crashes, I'm in trouble. If I lose money in the, in the bank, it's only money, I can earn it back. Right? So he says that I'm not interested in the security of a cyber system, I'm interested in the safety of a cyber physical system. Okay? Think about that when you go, when you're uh, flying back. Okay? So the idea basically probabilistic verification is that the state space is so large, if you look at all the possible states in there, could take a long time. Right? So basically the idea of probabilistic verification is that, can I say with some probability that uh, the properties that you specify, the logic properties that you specify will be satisfied. Okay? If uh, the safety property is satisfied 99.999% of the time, you can say, hey, I've tested enough. Okay? That's the idea. And so basically a simulink model of basically something that says that uh, in the next 100 time units, globally speaking, the fluid flow rate should actually should not go to zero okay? because of the knot in there. Okay? And as long as the probability of that is greater than 98%, I'm willing to live with it. The engine is not going to shut down while I am driving okay? based on uh, this particular uh, controller, if you will. Okay? And I guess uh, this is work in progress. The idea is uh, this, it's a very simple idea. Okay? Uh, of course, it's a very powerful concept, but it's a simple idea. The idea is that we are looking for, uh, looking at a large state space and see whether these safety conditions are being satisfied, right? But the safety violations happen kind of in a very narrow region. That's where you would like to actually sample more, right? You're actually trying to sample the space because it's probabilistic. You want to sample in a particular space in a dense way, right? So basically the idea is to basically introduce something called uh, importance uh, sampling and basically provide, actually get more samples in regions where actually the failures are likely to happen. And so what the idea is that uh, you can actually st state it very mathematically, that basically the density of the event that you're actually looking for, and you introduce what is called a biasing density, okay, which biases the samples towards the region that you're actually more interested in looking at where problems can happen, and it turns out that this uh, combination of the, the old density and the density that you introduce, the ratio actually is called the likelihood here ratio, and because you're multiplying the biasing density with the same factor, mathematically you're computing basically the correct value of you. So it turns out that I'm not go, cannot go into details, but uh, you're able to, for example, show that uh, the probability estimate of this property phi that we just uh, discussed, okay, is going to be true. Uh, is, uh, this is going to be holding true. Uh, will, will hold false only at a probability of 10 to the power of minus 50. Okay, very acceptable in uh, practical terms. Okay, failures will happen at that probability. Okay, with the relative error of 13 percent, which is not a big deal given this very small number. And which, so actually getting to this probabilistic level would be absolutely impossible with crude Monte Carlo techniques. Taking that many samples and checking would basically take a long, long, long time. Okay. Actually you have to sample a lot more than 10 to the power of 15 samples to get a result like that. Okay. So, so basically, so, so Professor Clark is doing some really fundamental work. Okay. So let me, I guess, move to uh, sensing, uh, smart sensing again. Right? So I talked about, I guess, uh, the two wheelers and the three wheelers and the four wheelers in the Asian city with uh, what seemed like a chaotic intersection, but they are making progress. They are living a uh, daily life, right? But meanwhile, if you can look at, I guess, uh, kids, uh, right? 
tourists basically taking pictures uh, that are uh, standing in the wrong places, right? basically have uh, different kinds of uh, activities going on on the roads. Right? So basically, lots of pedestrians and bicyclists, bicyclists get uh, killed. Okay. So actually, we can actually, using uh, our computer vision techniques, smart sensing techniques, we can actually track uh, bicycles, pedestrians, uh, uh, cars, and so on. And we can also actually get their orientation, their uh, angle of, uh, uh, their vector of movement as, as, as well. And we can, I guess, using cameras, I guess, in front of the back of the vehicle, in front of the vehicle, and so on, we can like find, for example, kids and different kinds of, uh, so the DARPA urban challenge that I talked about specifically excluded the presence of pedestrian. Okay. So nobody volunteered, I guess, at this point. Okay. So it's basically, so we, we have to worry about that in real life. Uh, so let me, I guess, uh, move on in the interest of time. So let me just play this uh, video. It's done by uh, Dr. Uh, Ritsky and the student, Hangi. This is a big video, it takes a while. So the idea is to basically be able to detect uh, bicycles. Okay. Uh, bicycles, remember, there could be a different orientations and so on. So we basically have got a bunch of uh, students from Asia who started riding bicycles like, like they would do in their hometowns. Okay. Uh, basically cut in and out of uh, traffic all the time. And you see that actually we are able to actually detect uh, these bicycles in real time. Okay. So it basically means that you would detect them, slow appropriately, and keep making progress. Okay. So that, that can be done as well. So, so real life scenarios can be dealt with. What is the? Uh, no, so the way this was really testing bicycle data, it was not done. Okay. Uh, but uh, I, I guess I'll show you a video later on where it can be done. Okay. Like we just have to be cautious about not killing any of our kids. You know, right? So, 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 okay. so you got your sense for basically a couple of things. Right? Basically, the future vision, I think, is where we ought to go. Okay? The 19th century uh, in the US was about the horse and the carriage. The 20th century was our uh, love affair with the American car. 21st century, I hope and I expect, that basically will be the era of the autonomous vehicle. Okay. Every century we need to come up with a new paradigm. Right? Every 100 years is a long time. Okay. So as I showed you then basically what uh, the vehicle Chevy Tahoe was called Boss after a GM research pioneer nam named uh, Charles Kettering and this nickname was Boss, Boss Kettering. Okay. That's why we called it Boss. Okay. So the question is what are we doing more recently? Okay. So let me just basically uh, remember actually the first clip that I showed you, right, the Science Nation video, it said that we are testing virtual valley. Okay. That always kind of uh, rubbed me the wrong way. Okay, because they write the script. Okay. So then we said we should be for real. Okay. So uh, let me just uh, play that. I am going to show you just a. So the music is not great, so let me reduce the volume. So the idea is that uh, you and your uh, family go to a shopping mall, get down right at the entrance, pick up your smartphone, push the button park, and you go inside. The vehicle goes parked itself. Okay, so that's the idea. So this is actually a real operational parking lot at CMU. You see the whole, all the bunch of cars out there. Okay, it goes parks itself, and then sometime later, so you basically have uh, dinner with the family, uh, blow some uh, money, and then stimulate the economy, right? And then on your way back, you pick up your you pick up your phone and basically say, uh, "Hey, uh, come back." In this case, the engine was running, we didn't have the mechanism that actually started automatically. Just, so that part is in a sense a simulator, but the next generation will have the right thing. Okay. So it actually comes back, it turns out, actually, you see that actually is going, going a different direction than it actually came in, because the, the lanes on the parking lot are uh, one way, it understands the map, it understands which is one way and so on. So it came in a different way. I guess I quickly edited it this morning, so I don't spend too much time on this. So it eventually comes back to where it started, comes back, you see that actually the pedestrians running around, they had no idea that we are actually testing an autonomous vehicle. If not, they'll be running away as fast as they can. <laughs> okay? And it turns out that then you get in, take control, and you, you and your family go back. Right? So in specific situations, autonomy will happen. Right? It's not just parking, parallel parking in a narrow space. It's actually doing parking in a wide open, uh, right, chaotic kind of an environment is able to do that. Okay? Uh, none of the other car uh, people who had parked their cars knew that this experiment was going on. Okay? Thankfully. Okay? And thankfully, nothing happened as well. So and then we said, okay, so, so we have built this, right? So you, if you recall the picture of uh, the Chevy Tahoe, right? With all the corporate logos in there, looks like a NASCAR uh, thing with, uh, right, with sponsors and so on, fine, right? But if you look at the sensors, there are 18, 20 of them and so on, mounted all over the place, things stay sticking out, right? To engineers like us, or scientists like us, it looks like a beauty, <laughs> right? For the person on the street who actually was paying a lot of money for that, what the heck is that? Why the heck would I pay money for that, right? So it doesn't make sense. 
So, so and then basically meanwhile it turned out that uh, because the Zappa challenge was really uh, built for a maximum speed limit of 30 miles per hour, we actually hacked the controller in the car engine control so much that it could not drive beyond 35 miles per hour even if we wanted to. Okay? That's how we engineered because we could get maximum acceleration out of that, maximum deceleration out of that. Okay? Brake as fast as you can, accelerate as fast as you can. Not meant for humans because humans are not supposed to be in there, in the competition. Okay. But in the real world, we need to basically do this. So then we said, okay, let's basically build a real platform that actually be useful in real life, right? Will be appealing in real life, okay? And I guess uh, the goal that I set for myself was that we want this vehicle to be able to drive autonomously wherever, whenever the average driver can drive in the U.S. Okay. So a couple of things to note: is the average driver in the U.S. Everybody in the U.S. thinks they are better than the average, though, right? <laughs> And in the US, I'm not talking about driving in Shanghai, Beijing, Bangalore, Mumbai, okay? When I go home to India, I don't drive. I can't deal with it, okay? I think those people are not normal, <laughs> okay? So, so I need to be able to do just in uh, normal conditions, okay? So, so th I'll just uh, play this video about what's happening now. So this is the new car, it's a uh, uh, Cadillac uh, 2011 SRX. Okay. So that's actually a radar behind the Caddy logo. We actually changed the metal logo into a, uh, an IR friendly. Uh, you basically had, uh, you saw a laser embedded into the, uh, there's a laser there as well. There's a laser. Okay. We're embedding inside basically into the body of the vehicle. Uh, it's a GPS antenna, the same color basically as the body of, uh, so it doesn't look different. And it, the one big difference is that you'll basically see a big red button. <laughs> <laughs> it's a safety button. Look, we are still developing, I'm still prototyping. You still want that. Okay. If you don't have it, right? So, and then it turns out that the computers are right actually inside uh, that uh, wheel well, okay? You know, when I, if you remember the clip, when I opened uh, the trunk, huge bunch of computers out there, all of that is completely hidden, okay? And uh, it actually turns out actually it can uh, drive itself, okay? Uh, this is actually driving blind, it's not using any sensors at this point. The actuators are in place, we are giving it basically a bunch of GPS waypoints, and it's basically driving blindly, okay? If you stand in front of it, it'll drive over you <laughs> happily. <laughs> There's no idea what it's doing. I right? just say I need to go there. It's just going there. Okay. So I guess this is taken about a few months back. We have been adding, integrating a whole bunch of sensors. We are basically uh, taking. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll say point out one thing in here. We basically watch the speedometer in there. If you can read it, actually says 40 mile, 42 miles per hour. Drives faster than bus on this road segment. Right? 40. We should be able. I guess our goal is to be able to go 65 miles per hour on a highway and so on. Okay. That, that's 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 what's happening here. Okay. So this vehicle is happening as we speak. Uh, we are trying to basically bring in uh, the good software that we had on bus, throwing away the bad things, adding new functionality for new situations, for example, driving at night uh, with pedestrians and uh, bicyclists and so on, driving on highways and so on, which uh, the other thing can, can do, right? I go back, uh, basically, like I said, the goal is drive wherever an average person can drive. Okay. So I guess so the, uh, that is the longer term vision, if you will, right? Which will eventually end up being incremental organic there will be a bunch of active safety convenience features, warnings about pedestrians, children, bicyclists, even the human is in control, a virtual valley, on-demand autonomy, a virtual valley, highway chauffeur is that once you get onto the highway, you basically uh, pull our button, go into autonomous mode, it actually will start driving, right? It's a lot more dangerous in some sense, the speeds are much higher, there's a lot more structure, no pedestrians and so on, okay? And then for example, if you're stuck in a traffic jam, you're driving at a few miles per hour, why the heck are you paying attention and basically getting upset, uh, right? Road rage and so on. So might as well basically sit back, relax, let the vehicle drive itself, and once the tra traffic jam gets cleared or the construction jam gets cleared, you take back control and keep going. Right? So I think those things will happen. All of that will require dependable, safe, embedded computing and communications, of course. Okay. So then I guess uh, now we'll go, let's go back up, several levels of abstraction, if you will. Right? So we're talking about smarter transportation. So smart vehicles using these uh, sensors, processors, communications, actuators, I do believe strongly that they represent the next wave of a transportation revolution where we'll have better safety, more throughput, higher efficiency, and so on, right? And I do believe, like uh, as quoted in the uh, clip, fully autonomous driving is well within our grasp. And uh, the, I guess thanks to our long-standing relationship with GM, GM uh, superiors, executives also uh, believe this. I hopefully we can make this happen, but full autonomy will be preceded by semi-autonomy and on-demand autonomy. Okay, semi-autonomy is that you control only uh, only some functions. Okay, on-demand autonomy is that, for example, on the, on the highway it drives, traffic jam it drives. On demand, you give up control. On demand, you take it back, right? And there'll be multiple intermediate uh, features and so on. Okay, and then V2V and V2I will actually are basically uh, uh, right. So <coughs> we as humans, when we drive, we do communicate with others on the road. Okay? Most of the time is negative, right? But there are times where when we are courteous, surprise, surprise, we let the person say, come on, 
come uh, much uh, because we know that they're going to be stuck with the expectation that when we are in the other position somebody will let us in okay? so so we do communicate okay so the same thing have to be happening here okay? so let's look ahead okay so i'm talking about autonomous autonomy transportation okay then the question is why am why am i saying autonomous transportation can i remove the word transportation okay for example if i can do this for transportation what does it mean for the home okay who likes to do laundry who likes to wash dishes right if we can basically operate in a very unstructured environment called transportation roads and so on to a bunch of crazies out there right can we have things that likely do things autonomously for us in the home what about the fields agriculture and so on just basically do right we don't have to talk about illegal immigration we just get the work done right autonomously right and then uh, for example the hospital right? healthcare can go a long way i guess uh, if you recall uh, many slides that dr gil put up right all these things were uh, so so things can become smarter and more autonomous and safer right no wires like she pointed out in the operating room of the future right the factory floor as well right and then planes already happening right so we can actually uh, have maybe planes maybe located closer so the delays at chicago or have uh, would be better hopefully right and then so meanwhile you can think of other sectors in the rest of society as well right uh, so let me just stop there so i think the future is bright and with uh, people like you looking at both the societal aspects and the technological challenges hopefully you got a feel for that there's some fundamental science needs to be done but then if you actually be map it to uh, reality the reality comes back and say say some of the assumptions that you're making are kind of way out there relax those assumptions satisfy that you can basically have a nice positive virtual cycle between the research side and the practical side and together cps hopefully we can actually have a humongous positive impact on society for the better okay thanks guys Okay, so so good, good, good question. Okay, so in that uh, challenge slide where I talk about exogenous and endogenous, I used to have a bullet called uh, legal implications. Okay, I removed that just being a technical idea. Okay, so I used to be very concerned about that. Okay, because remember the US, we are actually trigger happy. Right, anything goes wrong, sue somebody, particularly somebody with deep pocket. Right, and you keep going down the line until you hit somebody with deep pocket. Right, so that's basically the culture actually, people. Right, so I guess there are uh, two possible ways out. One is that. maybe just maybe the first deployment does not happen in the us maybe it happens somewhere else like qatar or singapore where they basically is a modern society kind of uh, authoritative control you can basically <laughs> mandate some things <laughs> and with this being a small region and so on so, so once it basically they demonstrate this is actually very useful for society and therefore basically it happens that's one answer the other answer is turns out is actually made me very happy and very optimistic a person from the insurance industry actually a representative from uh, we are national insurance firm came and talked to me okay he initiated the conversation and said when will you have this technology ready for deployment i said why we are happy to insure the vehicle <laughs> what <laughs> are you nuts he said no 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 we are happy to do this because from their point of view over time these things will become more reliable a lot more reliable than humans who get distracted all the time so to, from their perspective accidents will go down right so they actually they willing to basically take the stance and say yeah initially there may be things happening right the first few days of uh, flights just few years of uh, flights had problems the first few years of automobiles had problems the first few years of uh, cruise control had problems today you don't think twice about it right so, so i think so so i think that will be dealt with okay to be happy yeah. Okay. yeah normally the legal side comes later you know once you have the technology in place because you don't understand right. that first right so, so basically for example if it happens in some other country and then deaths are going down accidents are going down the us would basically be stupid not to basically have this the, the technology was invented here right fun yeah, yeah, yeah there's one other question so, one, one, one. okay yes so uh, for all the our passenger flight and i can see the net is stuck as well so like global this is the whole picture right if you could see the whole say No, so so okay. So I guess the demo, last demo that we saw was basically was a predefined path. Okay? So everything else, I guess, even the competition. Okay, we were basically given uh, uh, you need to go from point A to point B, but you need to go to certain points, just like a video game to act as checkpoints. But everything in between has to be plotted dynamically, 
looking at map information, sensory information, and so on. So things will be dynamically calculated, and that's where you'll be going. Right? And if there are obstacles being detected, you'll basically plan alternate routes uh, around those obstacles. Okay, so it's, it's all dynamic. It's all dynamic. Right? Then the last one, I guess, is because it's a relatively new implementation is basically uh, retarded at this point, but you'll see that uh, improving dramatically very soon. Okay. So th thank you for.